What up? What up, D? What's good, fam? Shout yeah, out to first... Theodore. My oh man, no question. Man, I was just giving a little, a bit of an intro about some of the things that we're gonna we're gonna talk about and how how far we go back, but specifically the fact that just cut right to it. DXT from the Bronx um, was there when this whole thing came together. Um, and once again, I like to remind people, um, it all started with the DJs, you know what I mean? Like people that figured out the technology to get the right turntables and a mixer and an amplifier and, uh, and the speakers and, and then develop these skills to basically do things that really was the foundation that this whole thing was built on. And I just like to say how I first meet DXT um, was just hearing what he did on the turntables, which was astonishing. I mean, his technique of cutting, of mixing. You know, back in those days when very few people in the beginnings of hip hop had the adequate type of equipment, not that that's an excuse for, for DJs that just wasn't all the way on point, but you knew what people were trying to do. It just didn't often happen as well as you, you, you know that it, they, wanted to, they wanted it to be until somebody did it with the perfection and the skill. And that's how I first like met DXC. You, we were at a party. I can't remember if it was uptown or downtown, but I remember going like, who is that cat? Um, on the turntables and uh, that kind of is how our friendship begins because you was just so dope <laughs> you know uptown but then when you came downtown a lot of things happened <laughs> you know I, 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 I lived uh, with my girlfriend on 19th street between 9th and 10th avenue downtown in manhattan okay. right so you know i was uptown all the time but um, i mean when once the downtown scene happened I, I was down there i think we we i think we met either dance terry or the mud club but it was it, it, or in the grill could have been in the grill but it was the the opening night for mm -hmm. me at the grill which i played a record for about 30 seconds mm. fire, fire marshal came and shut down the wow grill permanently Oh, boy. So I literally played at the grill for about 30 seconds. Wow. So just to give the audience some background in terms of this, like, really critical early, early hip-hop history, the grill was a Jamaican spot, a club on 2nd Avenue, 10th, 11th Street, something like that. And the, this, this spot, you go into the grill and you had to walk down. So it's kind of like a basement club but it was a, a full-on establishment it wasn't like a low ceiling or nothing but this place had reggae going on major reggae acts would come through and perform and that's what the grill was about and then this english chick i had came on the scene and she hooked up with this brother named michael holman the english woman's name was lady blue and she threw this hip-hop party and had i think Maybe Theodore was on one of the first flyers and a couple of other people. I think they maybe even got somebody like if phase two or Buddy Esquire, the original guys that did the old school flyers to do the flyer. It was phase two. Phase two, rest in peace, who recently passed away a few yeah. years ago. Yeah. And this is where I connect with DXC. Um, once again, his I can't stress enough at that point how incredible his cutting and mixing was. I mean, so much so that if you guys saw the movie Wild Style, at the climax of the of Wild Style, which is like a big concert with all the acts coming together, giving this big jam on the Lower East Side at the amphitheater, DXT ends the movie cutting good times. And it was like, once again, that was an example of what you did so masterfully. In fact, um, DXT, another connection that we have is he was the first person to take the record that I made, change the beat or change the beat, you know, to put the French accent where I, I rapped in French and English. And the thing that made this record, I think, so unique and so special, DXT starts off this like major domino effect of cutting this sound on the end of the B side of my record where I went, ah, this stuff is really fresh. DXT cut that 
on Herbie Hancock's Rocket, which was a real pivotal breakout record early on that didn't have anybody rapping on it, but it was an incredible record, an incredible vibe. And DXT is like the, the climax of that record, like a percussionist uh, cutting my, my record on Herbie Hancock's Rocket. Talk about that, D. Hey, well, thank you for not coming after us. <laughs> well, I mean, it was, it, you know, I was celluloid also. So it was a, it was a, oh, yeah. it was a family thing. We all oh, were God. records. So many connections we have, right? Right, right. So I, I, I was part of the, the first five records. I was part of the That's so record. true. <laughs> that, that did those, made those records. And yes. So, um, you know, oh, it, the, the, yeah. the, the, the whole thing was, you know, I, I realized that my approach was, you know, it's based on my musicianship because I'm a musician first. Thank you. And so, you know, um, and, and, and uh, you see, I, I'm wearing the hat, and, 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 you know, to represent, you mm -hmm. know, the fact that I'm on here with you and how important I, it took me time to grow up and mature to understand the magnitude of what you and Charlie was trying to do. Because in the beginning, I, I, I was, uh, you know, I was, I stood off from it. That's why I said, fill my hands. I don't, I don't want to be in the film, but I didn't, at the time I was too immature to recognize the genius of that because uh -huh. I thought as a purist of hip hop, that it was only about what we did. Right. The, the, the graffiti part was the generation before us, and I did right. not make the connection at the time mm -hmm. because I didn't know my own history. Mm. So in that, I recognized that over time as I matured, I realized this is all part of one expression. This is a human expression. Yes. Not a fad expression. Correct. And, correct. And, and so that's when I re recognized, man, these dudes, you know, they were on it already. I didn't see it, but I, I learned that. And that's when I began to, to appreciate the fact that the film the film actually happened. Because I remember <laughs> at first, y'all were like, hey, what's wrong with you? I was like, I just filled my hands. And, I don't want, you know? yeah. and then I, I realized, but I knew the importance of what I was doing because no one else was doing that. No one else approached the turntables from a musician standpoint. And, and so I wanted to, to demonstrate that this this can go further than just what the basic DJing skills that we, we were seeing. So once I saw that the Roxy became, everyone came there to see mm -hmm. that, you know, mm -hmm. I, I felt that, okay, let, let me take that to, to another level, you know, because I was thinking Guica, you know, I was thinking, and I never called it a turntable from that moment on. I called it a turn fiddle. Ha <laughs> ha. Wow. So let me just go in and give, okay, so we kind of jumped. I had to just throw that in because that, once again, that became this super significant part of the culture, a part of my life. The fact that to this day, people are still using that sound from my record, which becomes synonymous with the idea of cutting and scratching. But what I want to go back and just, you know, share with people. So after that club, the grill happened, and it wasn't even a year. It probably was less than six months. Several parties happened, and it became a thing. And the place was a normal size joint, not too big, not too small. But Blue had this idea that this could be bigger. So there had been this big roller skating trend boom that was happening, going that had been going on. It was kind of cooling off a little bit. And there was a lot of roller skating rinks that had opened up. There was one downtown on 10th on 18th Street and 10th Avenue right. called the Roxy. And so people were still skating, but not that much. And so Blue came, had an idea to take this party from the grill to the Roxy. And a roller skating rink is a really big space. And I remember she came at me and said the idea. I think, I said, you know what? You might play yourself by taking this dope party, which is packing this club into this giant roller skating ring. She said, I want you to come and see it. And I'm gonna tell you the idea I have, which was to put a huge banner across the roller skating rink and bring that all the way up. So the space wasn't as gigantic as it was. Yeah, we she, cut it in half. She cut, actually it was, actually, you know what? It was about, it was about two thirds were cut off, but right. as it grew, she would move that, that wall would move back. Cause I remember going and going, wait, cause there's all these people. But 
so that she put up a huge piece of drop cloth was the idea and then got all the graffiti people to do pieces and tag it which was futura myself dondi zephyr the whole crew and that became the roxy which became a big 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 thing on the scene which brought black and latin kids from the hood the bronx lower east side in brooklyn together with white punk rock new wave downtown folks that had never happened Everybody came together and partied together lovely. It, it became the first genreless dance environment. Exactly. And DXT became one of the main DJs that played at that party. And so, once again, everybody would be at that party and D would just get on them turntables and it was masterful perfection, the way you would cut, mix, and scratch. And a lot of people came and got their first glimpse and listen to hip hop music early records at that time like let me just think of some of the records that were big i remember well we had all did a, a group of records together on celluloid so we'd play our own records my record changed the beat <laughs> dxt's record with the it, infinity rappers the infinity rappers uh shaheen, shaheen Cashman, kc um, rock and kc rock the godfather and, the Godfather, and then there would be other joints that was big at the time, like Fearless Force, Rocking It, and I mean, you know, the, the sequence, you were just talking about them on early Sugar Hill acts. Those yeah. are some of the sounds that were played at the Roxy, and DXT was on those turntables. And what happened, the Roxy got so hot, and the records that we put out, we put out this group of five records on celluloid. It was myself, Chains and Beat, DXT's record. He was DST at the time in the right, Infinity Rappers. Up. Yeah, cuts it up. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Cut it up. It was um, uh, Futura 2000 had did a record that The Clash had played the, the music for. Um, Phase 2, one of the early pioneering graffiti artists. Um, then hip-hop, early hip-hop poster designer. Um made a record too he can rap and he he did a record call and the record he made was about the roxy the, about the roxy so anyway this whole thing blew up and the french people that produced the record they saw how big this can be probably a, a lot bigger than a lot of us did and they decided to have a tour in europe which was gonna which literally was the beginning of hip-hop going to europe man d it must have been about 30 of us right it was a, a nice group of people, um, at, maybe not that many, at least 25. 20. At least 25. So It, it was, was Rocksteady. The Rocksteady crew, which was, you know, the, you know, the, the breakdancers that blew it up. It was at least seven or eight of them, right? Right. Double Dutch, about four, four of them. The Double Dutch girls. Now, a lot of y'all that are not in New York may not know this. This thing doesn't happen that much. A girls in the hood would turn two ropes together to the beat and then the girls would jump in and it was amazing the footwork the rhythm double dutch and they say cool stuff but these were the championship winners of the double dutch and we wanted to bring them to and it was about four or five of us doing graffiti it was dondi futura ram lz rest in peace who rest was a protege of mine who did graffiti as well but he also rapped and um man and uh, Africa Bambata, and um, we went on tour Europe. We toured about, what, about 12 cities at least? Yeah, I, I lost count, man. It was, it was about 12 cities in France and a, sh a couple of shows, I think, in England. We did Germany too, Strasbourg. Ah, we played a gig in Germany. That's we when were... the, uh, the incident occurred. <laughs> <laughs> You know, wait a minute, Strasbourg. You're right. Yeah, is that Germany? That's, that's, that's that... where people ended up in the hospital. Who who did? A couple of people. Oh God. Okay. Yeah, we had some. Uh... And you know, it's just hard <laughs> if you can imagine. So this was called the New York City Rap Tour. Right. This is 1982, if I'm not mistaken. 82 or 83, D. It's a, a 83, 82, 83, somewhere in there. 82, 83. It was right at that end of the year, so it was right look, look, at the. Right here, I don't remember everything. That's right. We don't remember everything. But if y'all Google it. I get, I get a pass, man. You get a pass. Yes, we both get passes. <laughs> but what was so amazing was 
no rap records really have blew up in Europe. You got to understand this, this time frame. I mean, hip hop has been thankfully throbbing in everybody's lives on the radios for like at least three decades. I mean, blasted across the board globally, whatever. At this point in the game, no rap records have happened. People really clueless about all of this. And we, we went on this tour where we basically, it was like a free flowing jam session. We didn't really have a tight structure. Like it'd be time for D and his crew to go on and they would get on and tear it up and do a hot 15 minutes or so. Bam would be playing records. Ramp, you know, we get on the mic and just rhyme. It really felt like early hip hop. And then we would put up a big backdrop. Futura, Dondi, Ram, we'd go over and tag and do pieces. Rocksteady would come out and b-boy. This is what this first hip hop show in Europe, France, primarily was. It and was, we went it was basically a, a live block party. We took a block party. Perfect description. Town to town. There was no there was no run of show. Yes, right to tech. I know, run of show. All <laughs> yeah. the stuff that happens now when you Yeah, all of that, none of that existed. <laughs> it was who you getting on? You getting on? Okay, we're gonna get on that. You know? It, it, yeah. was, it, it was it was a block party that we traveled <laughs> with a block party and that and, was a perfect description. It was a block party. It was it was organic. So it was organic. Whoever and, I mean, he got got to it. Yes, and I mean, somebody would be performing, guys would be chilling out over here, just kicking it, but we all were who we were with a lot of flair, a lot of flavor, just what we naturally were, and I figured we don't know if the audience is going to like this, because once again, it's a language thing, rap is an English language-based thing at the time, but that rhythm and them beats, and when you know, they responded, and literally... Um, amazing time but the seeds that we planted on that tour france to this day is the second biggest market in in hip-hop um largely because the people that came out particularly in, in uh, paris i think we did a couple of gigs in paris we were on national tv people were like whoa and they got down at that point and those be those people became their pioneers of what became the second biggest market to this day in France. Um, right, right, right. Which was a pretty exciting time. So now, after this tour, DXT, then you came back, and that's when you hook up with Herbie Hancock. Well, what happened was I was approached by uh, Bernard Zecri, ah. uh early, before the tour. Interesting, okay. <clears throat> so... We had this huge meeting in a restaurant where I met Caracos, I met Bill Laswell, Michael Beinhorn. And so they said, hey man, we, we would like to you to join us. You know, we have this thing called material. We're making these records mm -hmm. and you appear to be a talented person. We'd like to bring you into our circle. Mm -hmm. and, and believe it or not, you know, I, I thought it was an opportunity for me to get my drum career going. You know, right, as a drummer, and they were like, "No, no, 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 no. We we want you to do what you do at the Roxy's with the turntables. That mm. thing you do that everybody just stops and stares there and stares at you. Mm -hmm. You know." And I I said, "Oh, okay, okay, then I'll do that." But I I felt that in in time I would be able to expand uh, with my musical skills, and eventually, I, obviously, I did. And also, I think it's interesting to point out that. You, your family has a musical background. You come from a musical family. Can you just share a little yeah, bit my, about that? My, my, my mom is a singer, and I used to go to her, her, um, her coaching, and I would have my toys and stuff there, but I would be singing along with her, with the to vocal coach and stuff. And he, she was classically trained. But what kind of singing... Was your mom doing back back at that time? Like I said, she would do she would do Billie Holiday, okay, stuff, jazz type stuff, jazz type stuff. But she was classically trained, in which so when she went to pursue her career, her classical training became an obstacle for her to be in the type of uh, career or the type of groups she wanted to play in. Mm -hmm. However, my 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 aunt Audrey, uh, she had a she had a hit single regional out. You know, okay. my uncle my uncle Rex had had a few hits. He did the James Bond 007, Queen of the Go-Go. And so I was around that 
stuff, you know. As a kid coming up. As a kid coming up. Uh, Highland Avenue was was the haven for a lot of talent. Even, even Jimi Hendrix was there once. Wow. You know, a, a lot of people went to that house, and I spent a lot of time there. So uh, me and my cousin Rex, you know, we listened to records all day. And we were around instruments all day. Got it. There I, we go. I got my first drum set. I, it, it, I may not even even been in school yet. One of them little drum sets with the Beatles on the on the hand. <laughs> yeah, you know. Then I got my second drum set. I was in uh, junior high. I was the drummer for John Philip Sousa. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, it's just part of my life. You know, and and um, the the whole transition to turntables was I, really cool. Herc is the person who really. So now you were okay. This is another piece because. Once again, let me just share with the audience. We 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 talked with LL Cool J before the pandemic about doing. This is just a really like a teaser of this podcast idea that I'm gonna work with Dion to really go deep into a lot of stories. Because once oh, yeah. again, when you go back to a certain period, there's really no documentation effectively or voices. Besides, you know, Cool Herc, once again, what happened at 1520 Sedgwick definitely happened. But there's so much more that was going on mm -hmm. that on our numerous conversations, D is always dropping jewels that have me, like, stuck. That's why we wanted to do this right now, November Hip Hop History Month and all that. Right. So talk about those early – you were at, at those early Herc parties? Well, I wasn't at the early earlier ones because I, I'm younger. I'm from the younger, but I was a, around the older people. Got so it. Answer. Around '75, we started hearing about Herc and Pal and all of this, and so and Smokey and the Master Plan bunch. Which so was, now talk about these guys. You just just so briefly. It, so there was two DJs from downtown. My first introduction. Talk about no downtown. Help us out. You talking downtown in the Bronx? In the Bronx. So so from on, on the west side of the Bronx and the South Bronx, and okay. so uh, me and my my group, we you know we were all dancers along Charlie Rock, Shiny Sean, James White, uh, 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 Cool Ray Express, Byron. So you talking break dancers? These all we all dancers, and so original it, break dancers, in other words. Yeah, well, we're the we're the babies of the first generation because okay. Sata and Trixie are older than us. Got it. And they're the ones who would. They, those are the b boys. They were. They, they, those were the people called b boys. Okay. Okay. We we all took that terminology home from Herx parties because ah. his dancers were called b boys. Okay. We were just th dancers, you know. Okay. And so um, there was a group in my neighborhood called TNT Disco, which was Tony O'Gara and Fat Tommy. And that was my first introduction into seeing guys with stuff set up outside with two turntables. Because even my neighborhood, it was a music neighborhood. There was always live band playing in the park. Wow. We had, we had Showmobile. And, and, you know, my sister is a professional dancer. Okay. Um, she danced with LaRock Bay. I think she a part a uh, part of Alvin Ailey as well. I think. Wow. And so show business was just everywhere. And there's a lot of talent in 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 Eden Wall Projects, even though it gets a you know a you know bad press. <laughs> you know? And so because um, a lot of thugs was up in there as well. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It was it was a it's a very interesting place. I, I'm actually working on a story, my story, which deals with how that whole thing transpired and affected my life got it and uh so fat tommy and tony o'gara were the dj's first time i somebody's playing loud music uh uh with turntables and stuff you know normally it was a band in our neighborhood right. and so that, that was the thing that got me interested but then some of my schoolmates we were all musicians in the band so mm -hmm. myself my brother chevy chev chevin we called him chevy chev okay and, uh timmy we called him Timmy Tim. Now, there's an, another Timmy Tim who we would refer to as the original Timmy Tim who was part of the Herculoids, right? So That was Cool Herc's crew, the Herculoids. Part of his crew. So gotcha. we adopt different names, but it was Derek, Shevin, and Timmy. Mm. And that was DST. Mm. <laughs> you know? And so we started going to, we were all dancers also, so we started going to Herc's parties. 
uh, and we go to the PAL to dance with with and and we dance in the center in our neighborhood. But we wasn't into we didn't know about these massive sound systems. Okay, we were content with the little box in the hallway. It's snowing outside. We practice in our moves. So then when we get to the community center with a, a you know a, a, a not even a much bigger system, but enough to hear it a little bit louder. We would mm -hmm. just dance. It was just about the dance. We wasn't thinking about the sound systems or any of that. Until... What were some of the records, if you could drop a couple of names of songs that were hot for the dancers then? Bongo Rock. <clears throat> uh, obviously, Apache became... Apache the... on the Bongo Rock band, yeah. Yeah, but we, Bongo Rock itself was, was one of the early okay. records. Okay. Uh, uh, Earth, Wind & Fire, Africano. Mm-hmm. Um, this uh, 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 shaft in Africa. Oh God, yeah. Um, Black Heat, love the life you live. Dynamic superior, funky music is the thing. Okay, baby Huey, listen to me. Woo, yes. You know, like we these and these were songs. Some of them were in our parents' records collection. Right, <laughs> which I think is so interesting about <laughs> where hip hop's early music the records that DJs cut and scratched and knew about, they were in the parents' record collections most of the time. And yeah, but it, it, the thing is, and here's the misconception, the, the terminology is what skews what really happened. Mm. So when you, when you use the term hip hop, you, you're severing the umbilical to the origins of the expression by, by not understanding that this, <laughs> this music has been going on for a long time. This is soul music. Yes. So, so we changed it to hip hop and we, we, Cut the tie. These, are, this is my mother's record collection. I'm playing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so you can't say my mother ain't hip hop. Then. You know what that, I'm saying? There you go. See you know what I'm saying? And so, you know, we we dug into our parents' record collection and found the obscure beats, the breaks on these these soul records. You wow. Know? And so, uh, you know, I'm the youngest of four. So, and there was house parties, either my, my aunt Audrey, my mother. And so these records are playing all the time, and we're in a, we're in a music environment. There's musicians, wow. you know, singers. It was in it was in your DNA, in other words, right? And, and um, so it wasn't a, a, a giant leap, you know, over to understanding the music of it. Mm. You know? And so once you know, it was it, the game was afoot. Once it was like you can go outside and set up your speakers and play your play your mother's record collection for your friends. <laughs> you know, and that's what it was before the terminology. You know what I'm saying? So so let me just briefly get a, a, a bit of this in here, D, because then I want to jump back to the record and you're going on the road with Herbie Hancock and the impact that had. Um, when did you start to really become a DJ? We go, okay, so you're a dancer, you're absorbing all this musical energy from the family and the, and the household. But your turntable skills, I'm just curious. I'm sure you were going okay, to so, different jams and parties. Right. So what happened was, you know, me and Shevin and Timmy, we started making what's called record button tapes. There was no such thing as the pause button at this time. Okay. And so you had to be very savvy with the technology of the time. And that was... You talking uh, about with the old school boom box, the classic the old boom school, box, but without the a pause version. Button. Without the pause, didn't have a pause button at the time. Wow. So you had to manipulate the, the tab on the inside of the deck to engage the record button so it's halfway down. Hmm. Okay. So and then you put the close the tape and you press play. So it's it's like that's the turntable on the right. Then okay. you have your actual turntable that you cue in and waiting for the part to cut in. Hmm. And so when it comes, if you want to be to be on time, you throw the record in and hit the button at the same time. So the button represented the fader and the record represented the turntable. Got it, got it. <laughs> and so it would just record right on time. Mm. <clears throat> and so that's why when people say I made uh, pause button tapes, then they, they timestamp when they got into it because there was no pause button when we were doing that. It was record button. And you, had, you had to figure out that some of them uh, were... Um, they had a delay on them, so you had to figure out all of these differentials in order to, to get it right. Uh, uh, um, and so by me doing that, I, I, my, my, my motor skills was already doing this because I, I had to hit the button and go like this at the same time. 
Wow. I never, I never used the mixer in my. You mean so you got one, one turntable, and that turntable was a, uh, uh, it had an eight track player built in it, <laughs> a component. Okay. And and then a cassette deck, and remember, I'm recording okay. out of the speaker. I don't. It's not plugged in. It's not hardwired together. I'm just recording from the microphone of the. <laughs> of the cassette deck from the speaker of this is classic <laughs> shit. If you guys, I don't know if you guys are, too, are young out there, you might not understand. We talk about the all-in-one stereo system, turntable <laughs> on top, radio, eight track. <laughs> um, eight track. That was a whole other thing before cassettes and right. cassette. I mean, all-in-one box. You got to understand. You got to go on YouTube. You might, you'll definitely see what we're talking about. <laughs> right, right. So, I'm already, you know, we're doing this. And because we were musicians, mm. there was no thought of playing out of time. Wow. And I explain that to people. The, 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 the guys that I started with, offbeat was offbeat. That's, that's a musician thing. And if you out of time, you out of time. Yeah. So even when we played our records and we started making these record button records, it was critical. Mm. It wasn't even a thought. And we would hear it at a time. So the first thing we did was, uh, uh, make sure that our timing was just as if we were playing our instruments. And as a mm. drummer, that's my thing, to keep time. Mm. So, so I'm all automatically, I always thought of time, and I would cut based on the drums. Where was the one? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Or if it was a 7-8 a, a, a time signature, I would have to read that and, and know that I'm going in 7-8. So when you eased into turntable, working on turntables now, these ideas of uh, clearly as you're explaining now contributed to your approach to being a dj would you say it was like what a percussionist player is like in a band i mean what would you like in what you were doing developing or i mean how would you have just express that well well for, for me you know being being in, in you know playing in bands you know most of my life it was more of whatever instrument I was thinking of. It was the improvisation of that instrument. It was mm. need to be able to improvise, even scatting. Like I listened to Ella, Miles, you know, Bird, Train, you know, mm. um, uh, Monk. And so, you know, my whole thing was, how do I apply this to this technology with my skill set? Wow. And so it was always for me, it was improvisation. And that's the reason why I came up with what I came up with that changed everything because I, I kept hammering that improvisation. Improvise, improvise. And so Ella, you know what I'm saying? So I'm, yeah. you know, then I'm thinking quicker, you know, all of these different uh, uh, um yeah, the plans uh, that I, I I knew and I saw, I tried to bring them in. I mean, I literally would just stare at the turntables for hours. And a friend of mine <laughs> called me the other day, uh, my one of my closest friends, Troy. We call him Ice. Mm -hmm. He said, "Man, we used to come to your house at twelve o'clock, and you'd be standing there staring at your turntables. We come back at seven or eight o'clock, <laughs> and you'd still be sitting there." Staring. <laughs> and it was one I only had. That's when I first got my first technique turntable. I only had one. And that, <laughs> yeah, that helped me because I only had one. You see I what I'm saying? It. Wait so a minute. I, Let me just, I'm sorry for just jumping in. I just wanted for anybody that might have jumped in in the middle of this. Um, I'm Fab Five Freddy talking with my longtime good friend. Grand Mixer DXT, one of the kind of pivotal, literally foundation people in this whole hip hop game, particularly DJ and particularly musicianship. We got a lot of history together and we're doing this hip hop history month. Rock your bells, baby. We all the way in. Just want to chop it up with my man here for a minute. And so that's incredible, D. This is like, I, lo I so love hearing this because also for me, just to interject, Max Roach, pioneering bebop jazz drummer, was my godfather, close friend of my dad. They were childhood buddies together, and he was a big fan of what was going on with early hip-hop, really was aggressively wanted to be involved and do things with it. So now I want to just jump in now. I want to take it back, um, and we're going to do this again in a more full-on version where we're going to 
we go and and let me just say something about Max. See, the whole hi hat thing plays a major role in just that whole approach. And people huh. like for the musicians who who knew who knew Max work, right? Remember, he the hi hat thing was that was the right. turntable. You see what I'm saying? Max did this thing where he would have the hi hat. That's that drum, that cymbal that you step on, right? And he would play that thing with one of those wire brushes. Brushes, right? He brush and he you gotta see so going he's, to he's already oh man it's insane he's already doing it you see yes. what I'm wow. and so those ideas went it went into my brain computer you know because i'm a drummer so max is a video of you know, television i would oh, watch man. max so all of that I, mm -hmm. I brought with me into the turntable into the turntables i love this so much so now let's go back now to we been on tour in Europe. We did the European, the first hip hop tour that goes to Europe. New York City rap is the name of the tour. Break dancers, graffiti artists, DJs, the whole package went on tour and planted the seeds of hip hop in Europe. And when you came back, you then hook up with Herbie Hancock, jazz giant, who, who came up under Miles Davis, who wanted to do something unique and different. And he they brought you in to play the turntables. And Herbie Hancock, you told me something incredible, which I've never seen documented. We're going to lay it down right here. What Herbie Hancock described what you were doing. He said, you are a what? He said, I'm a pianist. Wayne is a bassist. You're a turntablist. Thank and you. I was like, I'm a DJ. So, <laughs> <a> turn <laughs> Well, I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't feeling that at all. <laughs> he said, "Your turntable is." I was, yeah, you bugging, bro. I'm a DJ. You bugging. So, so now, if you guys really know hip hop, and y'all know about the scratch pickles on the West Coast and uh, the executioners, that whole turntable thing at a level that is like so beyond anything, like the skills and techniques. DXT is the beginning of that. And thanks to master jazz maestro, pianist Herbie Hancock, he blessed you with that name, which is turntablism. I was in Abu Dhabi um, uh, recently for a hip hop photo exhibit that I helped put together called Contact High. And I, we got to go over there. And the Boston, what was it? Not the Boston, what is it? The, um, the Berkeley School of Music out of Massachusetts has a satellite school in Abu Dhabi. And they teach turntablism on the curriculum at the Berkeley School of Music. When I was in Abu Dhabi, they took us on a tour and they had a whole room full of turntables. It was just surreal to see right, right. where people go in. Like you could literally get a degree in turntablism. Um, yeah, and, and it took me a while to accept the terminology. I, I finally said, okay, you know, it, it's, it, 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 okay, it makes sense. You know, I, again, I was, I was not mature enough to understand a lot of things that Herbie was trying to show me at, at, at 18, 19 years old. And I'm playing with one of the greatest musicians ever on the planet. And so, you know, as I matured, I began to understand, you know, um, the, the, line, the lineage that I was part of now and, mm -hmm. and the fact that, you know, they saw me as a prodigy and the the term, yeah, because a lot of the ideas came out of my head, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, so I, I began to over in, in in recent only in recent the last ten years did I, you know, uh, connect myself to the terminology. Even though he 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 coined the phrase to explain what I did. Wow, you know, <clears throat> that's so dope. And so once again, at that point in time, that record drops. Early phase. What what year was that, D? What, what, Eighty three. Eighty three. Herbie Hancock's Rocket drops. Um, handful of rap records exist at that time, but they're coming out, and people are figuring out how to really make real hip hop records. You know, um, and DXT at this time is traveling the world as a part of Herbie Hancock's band. I mean, you were a featured part of the lineup of musicians, and you toured the world. Like, give, like, what was that like? at that point in the game for you? I mean, I guess it felt like you were following 
the musical tradition of your family. I mean, I didn't, which I didn't even know any of that at the time. Yeah, was, well, you know, after the first tour I had ever done uh, of that scale with, with you and the rest of the crew, we all went out. I think that was the first for most of us. And so I got a taste, but I didn't realize the magnitude of that level of touring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I joined the Rocket Band, which was formed for this record. And uh, we did the full-blown tour, the real rock and roll on the bus, on the plane, <laughs> in the hotel, <laughs> on the bus, on the stage, back into the bus, back to the next town, mm -hmm. off the bus, on the stage. And um, it was it was a, a, a serious education. Uh, I was, you know, 19, 20 years old, the youngest person. I was from a community that did not, you did not get a lot of uh, self-control lessons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and when to shut up lessons. And so I, I, you know, I was on the bus, you know, creating, having issues and problems and stuff. But wow. I had to mature because, you know, I, it, it's something I wanted to do. And, and I enjoyed it. And I, I realized that every day I had to get on stage. And, and if I did not enjoy that, that was a problem. Mm. So I had to condition myself, even days when I was tired, that this is what it is. And now I'm, I'm there now. Wow. And this is at the highest level of the entertainment business. And, it's, you know, I'm at the highest level. And I'm saying, man, this is a lot of work. But yeah. now I understand the, the grind. You know what I'm saying? Go hard or go home. Mm, mm, and that's, mm. that's, that's where that term uh, uh, it, it reveals itself. You go hard or go home. That's it, baby. Yep. Yeah. And so Her Herbie, you know, was a great tutor of, of musicianship, showmanship, and mm -hmm. he's a master. And so you to, to be able to uh, sit with a master, you know, of, of, of that level, mm -hmm. And, and be able to pick his brain and every day, you know what I'm saying? Amazing. And you know, I just want to say that's, it, that's, that's amazing about that experience you had and thinking of the lineage, particularly of open-minded people. Um, so Max Roach clearly, I mean, God, if Max and my dad were still alive, they'd be close to 100 now. But at that point in time in the 80s, when I was, you know, figuring out how I was going to step into this culture and dabbling with this and dabbling with that. Max got a whiff and he was wide open, loved it, encouraged it, what have you. Max also had a very close relationship with Miles Davis. And Miles was the probably the penultimate example of reinventing yourself. When he went from cool bebop jazz, but other cats was wearing suits and, and he was doing around midnight and all of that. And as the game changed, Miles said, I'm changing with it. And he put on like a Jimi Hendrix type of psychedelic soul, funky thing, electrified his horn, and then got with a whole lot of younger musicians um, that were all game changers. And Herbie Hancock was one of those musicians. So I like the fact that Miles like changed his whole thing up, got with a, a whole other genre of music, worked it into his own style, made it his own. And then all the young cats that he, a lot of the pivotal cats became leaders on their own right. Um, Chick Corea, um, Santana, um, Herbie Hancock, um, and then Herbie Wayne, Wide Wayne Shorter. Thank you. So many great guys. And then, Her and then Herbie in the tradition opened his arms to you and hip hop is such a pivotal time. I also want to point out to people, if you don't know, you guys don't know Herbie Hancock's Rocket, go on YouTube, it's right there. And then MTV, where I would then later work, um, when the MTV phenomenon started, their first video music award, the winner of one of the big awards that year was Rocket. Okay? And it was like eight it was what? Eight MTV Awards. Wow. Eight MTV Awards were won by Herbie Hancock's Rocket. And because of the racism and the bullshit that still goes on in different right, levels. Right. Before you go there, I want to, before you change, um, 
at the premiere of Possibilities documentary, what you were just talking about, Herbie looked at me when you're talking about the changing of the, you know, passing it down to the next prodigy. Yeah. And how Miles put them together because they were young and new. Right. At that scene where he was, Miles was introducing Herbie for the first time. Wow. Herbie looked at me. He, he sat right next to me. He, he nudged me and he said, that's you. He said, that's you. Wow. You're the next, you were the next one to come along in that lineage. In that but lineage. It, that was the, that, that was a very. And, um. I was blown away to know that he saw me as part of that lineage. No, nah, that's so special. And rightfully so, um, with this music standing as the most listened to uh, music on the planet. But I just wanted to say that because of the racism in the music business, um, particularly at that time, right. Herbie Hancock's Rocket video, which was really a, a really good video, didn't really have many people in it. In fact, robots were the featured players. I mean, Herbie popped up a little bit, but to illustrate what you were doing scratching, they had like these robots moving, which I thought was very clever. But then when you think about like there was a cleverness beyond that to overcome the obvious racism, um, where they had robots. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to seeing you and the other musicians that made that incredible record. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I, th uh, that video was always a bittersweet moment for me. And wow. I, I actually got into it with the, the owner of MTV over an uh, interview I did. And uh -huh. I, wasn't, I wasn't really attacking MTV. I was, I, was, I was pointing out that at that time, we still mm -hmm. were dealing with the social constructs that negatively impact in, in expression. Woo, woo, well said, well stated, damn. And so here's, here's my moment, and because MTV did not play Melanated People at the time, um, we won M eight MTV awards with, uh, you know, white robots and mannequins. And so, you know, <laughs> I think I think Fab, you, your screen has frozen, so I'll wait for you to come back. But you know, I I I, I didn't say it in you know angrily, you know, in, you know, with, with venom, as I just expressed it as a fact of the time. Okay, we went offline. So this this is Graham Mix of DXT. I don't know what happened to Fab, but um, it, 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 you know, uh, I think that MTV eventually came around and played a major role in uh, what we're calling the hip hop culture uh, expand globally. And I, I, I thought it was a an awesome uh, adjustment. Uh, shout out to Fab who did your MTV MTV raps. And also Sophie Bromley, who did Yo TV raps in 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 Europe. And uh, I guess this is this is my show now, unless Fab is going to come back. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, took, I, I took over, bro. I, I kept going. You no, know, you handled it. I, I was hearing you, and you know, I I think about this something at almost every early hip hop party. The MC at some point had to get on the mic and said, "Technical difficulties." It almost was like, yo, if you don't have technical difficulties, baby, it ain't uh, hip hop. <laughs> yeah, this is this is straight hip hop. You know, we had half half made wires. And, you know, I'm actually working on a a, a, a production now uh, um, that that is uh, it's going to be the real deal, mm. and uh, we, we it's it's in production now. It's going to be awesome. And I actually, I, I we got I got to talk to you about it. Oh, man, you know, we could talk anything. But listen, D, we're going to wrap this up, man. This has been, oh, man, I, I, once again, whenever me and DXT get on the phone, we always drift into so much of this, and there's so much more. Um, and we want to definitely, we're going to put this together in a proper way. We're going to be on the Rock the Bells 
uh, platform on Sirius, and Al was like super excited. Because once again, man, DXT was so integral in the beginnings of hip hop. And there's so many stories that haven't been told from that early period when it was just DJs and parties in the street in the Mecca, the Bronx, where so much of this came together. And I so appreciate hearing these names. And we talked about pulling some of these people out of the woodwork, getting some photos so they can get a little bit of light and we can put them in this his hip hop history, which once again, Hip Hop History Month, that's why we wanted to do this. And I want to thank my man D for just being so eloquent, articulate, and just so audacious and just crazy with the way he does his thing continually. By the way, you know, Thelonious Monk, great jazz maestro, and I grew up in a jazz household, was always one of my favorite musicians. And about a year and a half ago, you uh, engineered, produced a, a recent found th Thelonious Monk uh, album that came out that you put the whole thing together. Yeah, Palo and Alto, Palo Alto. And we, we won the uh, Japanese Grammy for that. Wow. Best jazz record. And, uh, and so, but what exactly did, did, did you, what did you, what do you, explain briefly what you did to, to this was the engineer. I remember you told me you had to put the tapes in the oven or some stuff like what? Yeah. So, so first thing is the tapes had to be baked to be transferred because a, a quick science class, the magnetic particles on the tape, um, uh, lose the tape ad adhesive uh, elements lose their their uh, adhesiveness so you have to rejuvenate that by heating the tape oh, wow. so that the magnetic particles can recling to the tape otherwise they come off on the head they start flying around the room so that's the first thing that had to be done and then what I, I innovated a technique called forensic editing that I did on the Monk Coltrane record at Carnegie Hall about 10 years ago so wow. Monk came back to me to, to do this new one. Monk Jr. came back. Monk to Jr., me. right. Son. No, yes. and, and, and Monk Sr., because he, he was in my head. You know? <laughs> I love call, it. Calling love me Youngblood. Youngblood. Get that, get that. And he was talking about the tape hiss. Because oh. that, that's the technology of the time. That wasn't played on stage. Wow. And so my job was to re remove any ambient anomalies that was non musical in the performance. And I came up with a technique to do that. And it works. And mm. so I'm the only person that can do that because it's my secret. Grand Mixer DXT uh, with his seek new secrets, similar <laughs> to the way DJs back in the days would soak the records so the label would come off so you could not see what they were playing. You know what I mean? <laughs> DXT right now still in the lab showing the innovative techniques and some of the foundation technology that's always been underneath hip-hop i've always connected to that you know my inner nerd is 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 alive and well you know what i mean and so it's always good to chop it up with you thank you so much grand mixer dxc we're gonna do this like i say y'all we got plans to come in with a dope ass okay. podcast that dxc is <coughs> really gonna run and we're gonna share our stories and we're gonna take it back and uh, some music and some images of some of these people, some of these real, 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 real pioneers in the game. So thanks, D. This has been incredible, my brother. My brother, thank you for having me. Shout out to Thelonious Monk the Third. You know, ah, yes, <laughs> yes. So much, oh man, this is so incredible, man. So that's what's up. Hey, yo, thanks everybody that was yep. tuned in in the chat and the live. What's up? We see you, we feel you, we hear you. Hey, yo, stay safe out there. Keep it real. And we rocking them bells, baby, until the break of dawn. Two fingers. Peace.